This is the Week in Sustainability from Sustain Life. It's where our team of sustainability experts and practitioners share commentary to keep you up to date on developing stories and news. Hi, I'm Hannah Ansofsky, Sustainability Data Analyst at Sustain Life. Today I'm joined by a new face. Sarmishta Mahendra is our Senior Manager of Partner Enablement. Sarmishta, how are you doing today? Doing very well, Hannah. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to our conversation. For the benefit of our audience, as the Senior Manager of Partner Enablement, I lead our partner growth and development and support our partners in their success as they leverage our platform and their ESG advisory practices. Awesome. Thanks so much for being here today. We're going to be talking about two publications that came out really recently, and they address some really core themes that come up again and again in the world of sustainability. Last week, the University of Exeter's Institute and Faculty of Actuaries published a really really brilliant paper on the limitations and assumptions of the climate models used in financial services. But to start, Just yesterday, the International Energy Agency published its first inaugural edition of the Critical Minerals Review. This report covers investment and market technology and policy trends in the critical critical minerals sector in 2022. The project of transitioning away from fossil fuels is immense. Um, Much of our infrastructure was built on fossil fuel dependent on a fossil fuel dependent world. And now we're tasked with redirecting our energy system towards renewables. And that is quite an undertaking. And we're trying to do all of this in significantly less time than it took for us to build a fossil based system. Um, And we already look to the IEA for best in class insight into global energy markets. So what are some of the main conclusions in this report that you saw, Hannah? Of course, we, we can't really cover everything that they had to say here. But largely, I found that this supports a lot of our existing predictions on on the energy transition. In both good ways and bad, the transition is picking up speed. Deployment of solar panels and wind turbines and electric vehicles all hit new records in 2022, and they're all expected to continue in 2023. That feels like good news that the demand for this technology is growing. Um, So is the growth in the demand for renewables underpinning the growth in the critical minerals markets? Right. Yeah, that's exactly what's going on here. You know, compared to 2017, the market size for energy transition minerals has doubled and it's reached a $320 billion industry. You know, markets for minerals like copper and nickel and lithium have all doubled, but these are minerals that we've already been mining in large quantities for a while. The trend really shows up when we see that the demand for rare earth elements like neodymium that's used in electric vehicle manufacturing those resources have also spiked in demand. But speaking of EVs or electric vehicles, I remember reading about supply chain issues and battery production for electric vehicles was holding up the market a few months ago. Is that something that's covered in the report? Yeah. So the the point about batteries for electric vehicles in the report is really interesting. You know, the battery market right now is is pretty dominated by developing batteries for EV production. It's up for debate as to whether you know their time could be better used, spent on um, developing storage for the power grid. So EV production was halted by the availability of these batteries, and they highlighted this interesting tension between battery production and consumer taste. We remember that the first few electric vehicles were pretty small cars, and now American car consumers are, are open to these electric vehicles, but they want to hold on to their trucks. And so this push for larger personal electric vehicles has created the need for batteries that can support that. Right. So it's like safe to assume that as the market demand for these minerals grows, the mining industry itself needs to expand to meet that demand. And while it's great that the demand exists, can you dive into a little bit more about of the negative implications of the industry working towards meeting that demand? So you know, when we when we think about the fossil fuel economy, environmental damage comes from a few different spots. You know, it comes from the eventual combustion of the fuel itself, as well as the constant extraction and transport of the fuel. And renewables eliminate emissions from that, that sort of eventual combustion period, but the extraction and processing and manufacturing needed prior to the installation, that's still of huge concern. So, you know, mining is really risky to to the worker and to the surrounding communities, as well as the regional environment. Absolutely. What does the report have to say about the mining industry's progress towards actually minimizing these risks? 
there's there is notable progress. You know, um, the gender balance of workers is steadily improving, and we're definitely seeing um, improvement in terms of the the companies that own and operate these mines are investing a lot more into surrounding communities. I don't want to underplay progress like this. However, you know, worker worker health and safety, the emissions associated, the water use, the waste production in the mining process. Those have all remained consistent. And, you know, personally, I'm not comforted by improvements of, of these social metrics when the core danger to workers and communities and the environment is, is predicted to grow. The countries that are already the richest in these minerals are, are countries in the global south that are already facing the biggest threats of climate change. We can't consider the energy transition successful if it results in further exploitation of the same countries. Right. So I was listening to um, Ezra Klein's most recent episode on the Inflation Reduction Act and the state of decarbonization. And there's a worry that minerals like lithium will be mined from Chile, processed elsewhere, and turned into technology that these origin countries are eventually going to be priced out of. How does the report address mineral extraction from these resource-rich countries? Does so in a few ways. Investments in critical mineral development are up. 30% 30% in 2022, up 10% from 2021. You know, these investments are going mostly towards known resource deposits as well as exploration. So this the search to diversify certainly is on. Still, the bulk of extraction right now is in the same handful of companies that always or countries that always has been. China, Chile, Peru, Japan, Australia dominate the copper and lithium extraction market, and, and China is ahead of everyone else when it comes to the ability to process these minerals. Of course. And there's also a demand for responsible procurement and equitable access to the eventual technology. And it sounds like there are still a few unanswered questions about the future of mineral procurement and what it looks like. Um, Like, will we we be able to increase extraction to meet the demands of energy transition? And will the production have equitable resources? results for the workers and countries enabling the transition? These are certainly the most important questions. And they are, there are emerging policies in a number of countries that are attempting to address these kinds of future concerns, but the report just doesn't have answers yet. It is their first critical minerals review, so we can expect updates moving forward. Absolutely. And that's something to keep an eye out for. So on that note, Let's pivot away from the physical reality of energy transition and discuss some of the findings on how financial institutions are thinking about climate change, climate science. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. Uh, The the University of Exeter's Institute and Faculty of Actuaries found that the models that financial services are using are dramatically underestimating the risks of climate change. Interesting. So I feel like you don't usually hear a lot about the inclusion of climate science in financial decision-making. But it definitely makes sense that financial services institutions would want to incorporate potential climate events to improve their risk assessments. Absolutely. Reporting frameworks like TCFD, they already focus on this relationship and and focus on understanding exactly how climate is posing a material risk to companies' economic performance. You know, we've we've discussed on this podcast previously that insurers are adjusting their behaviors and, and their business models to recognize flowing, growing climate risks. We definitely want financial firms to be weighing the costs of climate. The problem is that's detailed in this paper is that the models that they're using are are producing these like these artificially benign predictions. Well, models by their very nature can't be perfect. What are some of these implications of these artificially benign predictions? Yeah, this is this is something that the paper really wrangles with. Models are just models. You're right. They can't be perfect predictors, and they we don't want to treat their results as, as gospel. And on the other hand, some models can be built incorrectly. We've already experienced that the climate, that climate disasters are costing us billions of dollars a year. There are really significant safety risks. They disrupt supply chains. They interrupt daily life. When a financial institution's models are predicting that a hothouse world, you know, four degrees above industrial temperatures could be an economically positive outcome, that's a huge red flag. Right. And we often state that there's a disconnect between translating academic discoveries to actual strategy implementation. 
In this case, where exactly is the disconnect in integrating climate scenario analyses into these financial risk models? The, the Global Association of Risk Professionals surveyed financial firms globally and, and found that about 80% of these firms are, are using climate scenario analysis in 2022. So there isn't a disconnect in adoption, which is good. Um, the biggest issue is that these models don't properly incorporate the, the real world cost of climate impacts. You know, if you're just isolating warming, then your model won't see costs of sea level rise and won't see costs of property destruction and crop die off restricting food access. These are the kinds of costs that compound over time and chip away at normal economic function. You know, the, the best metaphor in this paper said it's as if we're modeling the scenario of the Titanic hitting an iceberg, but excluding the possibility that the ship would sink. These predictions are coming from outsourced models and financial firms don't have the expertise in-house to interpret their results. This is breeding proper improper application. So for results, you know, results of models that are built on near term time horizons of, of one to five years shouldn't be applied to longer term decision making. And other models are built off of assumptions like that assuming that we're on the correct trajectory to meet the Paris Agreement, when in reality, we're way off track. Right. And there are so many different places that these models can be where these models can be designed or implemented inappropriately, what would a path forward look like to achieve better accuracy? So, so first, models should be incorporating current emissions rather than assuming progress. This recommendation that I think has, has the most potential um, here is to actually pair this modeling with qualitative narrative. The task of reaching a net zero world requires climate literacy in, in professions that haven't always existed or, or or asking climate literacy of professionals that don't usually keep it in mind. And so the mean this means that model creators would be able to better convey exactly what a model is meant for and also exactly what a model is not meant for. And so the hope is that these additional narratives will demonstrate how these models need to be applied rather than kind of allowing their claims to spiral out of control. Absolutely agreed including more narrative alongside these models seems like a very helpful addition to bridging the gap between climate experts and financial experts. And this podcast has previously discussed the implications of science communication or, well, lack thereof. Um, and observations from actuaries do highlight that climate expertise cannot exist in a silo. Exactly. You know, the, the more people that are employing sort of systems thinking and, and a little bit of understanding around climate the stronger all of our systems become. And, and that's a perfect note to end on. This wraps the week in sustainability. So Mishta, thank you so much for joining me and thanks for watching. Thank you. Sustain Life is a sustainability management SaaS platform with deep carbon expertise that helps future-proof small and medium-sized enterprises by taking climate action. Go to sustain.life to learn more. Thanks for listening and watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel or your favorite podcast platform. We'll see you next week.